video storytelling, visual storytelling. It's engaging, inspiring, it's powerful, and it can compel us all to take action. See, video storytelling is the art of connecting with audiences on an emotional level. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Greg Morgan, and it is a priv privilege and a pleasure to be with you this morning. Fiona, thank you for that kind introduction. In this presentation, I'm going to demonstrate to you the amazing power of visual storytelling. Let's start with this. How about that? that? That's a way to kick off a presentation, get some video. That's what video does. But wouldn't you agree, there were some very powerful video images in that compilation. Mm -hmm. Now, I bet everyone in this room can remember, can relate to, or have been moved by one or more of those images. Am I, am I right? Mm -hmm. Every time I watch that, it still moves me. And why? Because, ladies and gentlemen, video, video connects emotionally. It connects people and video stories inspire us to take action. Welcome to a revolution. A revolution in storytelling. Now there's a new kid on the block, a new kid on the storytelling block, and it's video. And today I will show you the power of video stories and why you need to use video in all, in all your marketing, your branding, and your public relations. And why you need to capitalise on new technologies and digital channels and mobile connected devices with video. Now, I have a lot of video in this presentation because video is a great way to augment your story, story. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. The agenda for the presentation today is in three parts. Now, the first part, I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey way back and show you how I was bitten by the power of video stories at a very young age, when I was a young boy. I'll show you a few clips from the TV news and global documentaries that I've produced, and I'll give you a first-hand look at what it's like to work in a war zone. Now, the second part of the presentation, I'll show you why video works so well and share with you a couple of powerful video stories that will simply blow you away. The final part of the presentation, I'll show you the amazing combination of video and social media and why video on the web is no longer a fad. Now the presentation will be pacey, some of it will unsettle you, hopefully some will inspire you, but hopefully it will entertain you and move you and take your emotions to a place where they've never been before. Now if you only have one 
take away from this session, I hope it's this, for you to seriously consider using video in your storytelling, because by the time this presentation is finished, you will learn that video has far greater impact than any other form of storytelling. I've always been drawn to personal stories and the will people have to go on and make a life. It's an incredible privilege to be a storyteller. Now, I remember meeting a, a, an Afghan baby named Layla. Layla was born to an Afghan father and a mixed race mother. Layla's father fled the Taliban and the war in Afghanistan to settle in Australia. But for some reason, Layla's parents couldn't raise her. Through no fault of her own, Layla became a victim of the war, a victim of circumstance, <coughs> if you like. At only three months old, she became an orphan. Now, I mention that because I have seen, witnessed, filmed and documented many visual stories on displaced people, refugees and orphans just like Layla. And it has had a long-lasting and profound impact on my life. Now, I want to take a step back, way back, and show you why I'm here today and how I got inspired to work in this business. I want to give you a first-hand look at why I've been in this industry for 20 years and why I know that video is such a powerful storytelling tool. Now, my fascination with video and video storytelling started way back when I was a kid watching the flicker of my favourite TV shows on our old Hitachi colour TV set. I want to share them with you. Uh, yes, look, classics like Kung Fu, Tarzan, Batman, TV shows that kids like me just love to watch. But it was a real life video program that really stirred my emotions. <coughs> real life video programs like National Geographic that really transformed me. I, I love the fact that Nat Geo would bring the real world into our living rooms every Sunday night. Our family was glued to the TV just to watch the world turn. I remember watching events on TV like the moon landing, the Vietnam War. It simply transformed me. I didn't know even what a TV journalist was really back then when I was an eight-year-old boy or what a TV producer was. But I knew at the time that I wanted to be part of whatever that world was. And little did I know it at the time, watching those documentaries back then would lead me to become an international television cameraman, producer and journalist. Working for the BBC, CNN, NBC America and yes, even National Geographic. I've had a front row seat watching the world turn. I was there when Saddam was caught. I was there when the bombs went off in Kutubali. I was there when the tsunami wrecked havoc. I was there when Mother Teresa died. I'm going to share with you now a few stories of capturing powerful video moments whilst working for these broadcasters. I'll start with this. I, the TV camera crew, under attack in a courthouse clash. I'm hitting the husband. Her face covered, she'd stumbled on the curb, prompting one family member to lash out at the nearest cameraman. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was me. <laughs> a little bit younger. Um, a, a typical day in the life of a cameraman, just doing his job, producing video stories for all to see. But little did I know it, I would throw myself in a worse situation than that in the very near future. The Hoddle Street Massacre. Now, I would imagine most of you, or a lot of you, would remember this. It was a brutal night in Melbourne some time ago. Victoria has suffered 
suffered the most appalling night of violence in its history. The carnage and confusion of Hoddle Street as violence erupted just a few kilometres from the centre of the city late on a Sunday night. Seven people killed, 19 injured, as teenager Julian Knight, a failed army officer, took his anger to the streets. We believe... Now, being the first camera crew on the scene that night led to being rewarded a Logie Award for the best news video story. Now, I remember the night very well. When I arrived, the police dragged me for the scruff of the neck, pulling me behind their van saying, get down, you're going to be shot, as Julian Knight was firing bullets. Melbourne woke the next morning to powerful video image of that vicious night. But it wouldn't be the first time that I had front row seats to history changing and life threatening moments. I then went overseas to live in Hong Kong, Southeast Asia, and I based myself over there to broaden my horizons in media, broadcast, TV and communications. Now living in Hong Kong, I was appointed director of photography on a Jackie Chan film. Quite a coup for a non-Cantonese speaking person. Here's a little piece from that film, a behind the scenes look, and I'm the one holding the camera. Now that was a fun job. I worked with Jackie about every day for about two months. Got to know him really well, became good friends. Uh, it was terrific. That DVD has sold in excess of three million copies. So uh, people just love video. And on, on a footnote, David Carradine, the star of the Kung Fu series, was on set. It was part of that film. So I got to work with my boyhood idol at the same time. So it was terrific. Now, living in Southeast Asia for 10 years saw me covering many TV assignments around the world. And this is one of the uh, many documentaries that I produced on, on refugees and orphans. Let's just have a, a peek at that. In the midst of that mass damage were two little girls, Laura and Hong. They were nine and six years old. The mother and young man sent them on a plane to a strange land of suburbs and shootings. They grew up as Tony and Joe, American men. But there was always something missing in their lives. The Vietnamese mother, they couldn't forget. They cut it out of the tunnel. And then, into a moment, 27 years in the making. <laughs> A reunion 27 years in the making. It's hard to understand, isn't it? That was an extraordinary story and powerful video images. I remember filming that as though it was yesterday because filming emotional scenes like that is very difficult. But I remember it well because my eyes filled with tears as I shot that reunion. But it wasn't long, only a matter of weeks really, before my next assignment took me to filming war ravaged emotion at its most brutal. I'm going to show you now what it's like covering a war for television. I spent several months in Iraq covering the war. Here's a look at some of the video images of war. Warning, some are graphic, but they are everyday scenes of what life is like on the streets of Baghdad. They are everyday scenes of what mums and dads and children have to live with. Let's have a look. We 
Nothing can prepare you for scenes like that. Nothing can prepare you for war. In a sense, it desensitises you. It hurts, it's gut-wrenching, it's frightening. Your life is at risk every second of every day. Again, the importance of my job, the importance of me being there, was to produce video stories for the world to see. Everyone must recall this footage of Saddam being captured and caught and pulled, dragged from his hole. Well, I was there when Saddam was caught and I broadcast his footage for the world to see. <coughs> this powerful vision that rocked the world. Now, following that capture, I did a live report to Australian TV. And I'll just show you 30 seconds of that. Reporting there. Now in Baghdad, we're joined by Australian Greg Morgan from Associated Press. And in Washington, former Clinton advisor, Dr. Tom Schneider. Thank you both for your time. Greg, if I can begin with you, how has news of Saddam Hussein's capture been received in Baghdad? Oh, the mood was um, one of uh, happiness. Everyone was um, joyful. The streets were lit with Iraqis firing their weapons uh, into the air because they were just so excited and, of course, relieved that their um, former leader had, had finally been caught. Do locals believe this will mean an end to the violence in Iraq? No, uh, I work with um, dozens of Iraqis here at the um, television centre at the Palestine Hotel. And they've all told me that, you know, yes, they're, they're happy that he's been caught, but the, the main uh, issue and the main concern for all the locals is the security, um, the security issue. And does it look like security will improve? It could take some time. Even after Saddam was um, confirmed caught yesterday, there was a, a massive ex um, car bomb explosion just at the back of the hotel here. Um, so, it's, nobody knows, we just have to wait and see for that. How's the problem? Now, you might have thought I looked a bit nervous doing that commentary. Well, I was bloody nervous because you couldn't see behind, the shot, behind me, though, in that shot, there was a number of Iraqis with their weapons just firing into the air. And I was quite anxious and nervous about being shot because when a bullet goes up, it's got to come back down again. And the number of people were killed that way. Here's a little piece, a video piece from a doco, which actually shows exactly what it's like to work in Baghdad, and in particular, the threat to the press. Free movement around the country is virtually impossible, and most journalists are confined to their compounds, heavily protected by blast barriers, sandbags, and armed guards. <coughs> the day before we arrived, Al-Qaeda demonstrated just how vulnerable journalists are, even in Baghdad. Using three car bombs, they breached the outer defenses of the Palestine Hotel, home to several Western network news operations. When the third vehicle, a cement mixer, packed... Two days after we left our Baghdad hotel, Al-Qaeda attacked it with a car bomb. Full vest that I put on last night and this morning. As we heard, the, the blast took place over there, about six of them. So I woke up, jumped out of bed, I put this on. Well, it's <coughs> morning now, I'm just going to show you how I sleep at night. Um, so this is what we do to the windows. I put one mattress up against there, stop the bomb blasts. And if we turn around, you can see my bed and the two bases I put up for a barrier to shield me. 
and I'll sleep here. You can see protection from blasts. And of course, all ready to go. That's better I've got. I believe it or not, I'm going back to bed. <laughs> Capturing video stories in a war zone, uh, I guess it's like a drug. The, the adrenaline is, addic <laughs> is addictive. It certainly is. Survivor shootout, the survivor bomb su to survive being shot at is simply overwhelming. It's really hard to describe that. But what's more addictive is showing the emotion of your video stories and knowing the effect they have on people around the world. I spent several tours of duty in Afghanistan, the world's most dangerous place. Here are some of my images that I shot of my time in, Af in Afghanistan. Now, filming in Taliban areas and poppy fields with a bounty on the heads of all media by the Taliban, you cannot go anywhere without armed escorts. I was there when five colleagues who went out to film video stories for the BBC and other networks were ambushed and shot dead by the Taliban. I cannot begin to describe the feeling that stifled our base when we heard that news. However, the world needed to know what was happening in this country, what the Taliban were doing to its people, and the most powerful way of doing that was with video stories. The tsunami, Boxing Day 2004. A catastrophic event. By this time I had covered two wars, witnessed firsthand the brutality of war and death. However, I arrived in Sri Lanka less than 24 hours after the tsunami hit, covering, it for, uh, covering this disaster for television. Having filmed in war zones, I still found the confrontation of the devastation and dead bodies overwhelming. After all, I was a hardened combat cameraman by then. I've never seen or filmed anything like it in my life, in my career. The smell of the dead, the amount of dead bodies I was literally walking over was gut-wrenching. But what amazed me the most about being there was the attitude of the survivors, the attitude of them towards me filming the carnage, filming the dead. You see, they all knew the power of video, the power of video stories. They knew of what it could do to help them and their country. Whether it's a war zone or a natural disaster, to watch these people and places change with the people who share your passion of storytelling is the most extraordinary experience. <coughs> Moving on to part two of the presentation. So what makes video compelling, engaging, and inspiring. Why does video content have such a profound effect on human beings? The reason why video works so well is because the human brain is optimised for visual storytelling. Video gives us an immersive sensory experience. Now think about it. Why do we all love to go to the cinema? Why do we all love to watch our shows, favourite shows on TV? Why do we buy those products we see advertised? Why do we support that charity we're so fond of? Because we get an emotional connection. And that's what video does. It drives that emotional benefit. And the most proven effective way of showing that emotional benefit is with good storytelling <coughs> and video. It doesn't matter what you're selling, what you're marketing, what your objective is, what your agenda is. Everything has an emotional benefit. Use video to demonstrate that. But why are stories so important? Well, because we all love stories. We always have. Stories are the essence of human experience. Have a look. As long as there have been people, there have been stories. Stories of survival and triumph. Comedy and tragedy. Maybe your jives now. Gambles, your songs, stories older than any living thing, and 
story is so new, they aren't even finished. Yes, we love stories. They awaken our curiosity. The date of the broadcast is 1939. Our leaders that teach, entertain, and inspire us. This will be the day! <laughs> Ultimately, stories are frameworks. Stories are containers for ideas, right? They're like a virus. Stories carry through cultures. Stories carry across continents. Stories connect us as human beings. But ideas and stories in the abstract are really hard to tell. It's much easier if I take an idea and fold it into a story. Like, here's a great idea. Don't walk by yourself in the woods. What does that mean? What does that mean? Little Red Riding Hood captures that really well. Little Red Riding Hood out walking in the wood by herself, meets a wolf, there goes the story. <coughs> stories make us laugh. Stories make us cry. By the way, this is voted one of the most tear-jerking scenes of any movie from E.T. And movies are great examples of stories. But stories ultimately make us do something. They make us feel something. Now, I'm about to show you three powerful examples of video storytelling. Now, be warned, a couple of them are quite confronting, but they are very moving. Here's a video of a young girl who was born deaf and received a hearing implant 28 years later. The video is of, is of the hearing aid being turned on and the girl hearing for the first time. How could you possibly convey that story without video? To, I mean, the written word could not do justice to her agony and her ecstasy. Real, raw emotion only video can capture. This next video on domestic violence needs no introduction. lately but I'm back, I'm here. Um, I've had a bit of a rough time but I'm going to be doing a video today on how to cover up. I'm first going to start with some foundation. If you apply a colour that is just gently off tone with your own skin tone, you can cover any fresh bruising. So just apply it lightly to start with and you can build it up as you go. If you've got a lot of bruising from being pushed hard against a coffee table, you can gently apply layer after layer and you will cover it up slightly. I know it might hurt. Just, just try your best. And that's, that's looking a little bit better so far. For my lips, I'm using a little bit more foundation. You might want to put concealer on over any splits that are caused from watches or rings. If you've got some bruising from a jealous type of partner, you can always just put your hair down to the side. If it's not long enough, don't worry because the scarf is ideal for this. So I'm going to be using a scarf and you can kind of hide it and cover it up. So that's perfect like that.
This next video, an award-winning video, takes a very upsetting subject and shows a viewer's reaction to watching heartbreaking images on film and ultimately spurs them into action. Now here's a bit of a backstory to give it some context. An American vaccine company wants to bring to the world's attention to seven neglected tropical diseases and hopes to generate enough funding to have them eradicated by 2020. See if you can make it to the end of the film. I warn you, it is tough. is a simple packet of pills. All it costs is 50 cents. To treat and protect a child for a whole year against all seven of these diseases. What's even more amazing is that if we all join in, we can see the end of all of them by 2020. Join in and be part of something huge by liking N7 on Facebook, making a small donation and spreading the word by telling all your friends. Together, Together we can see the end. to the final part of my presentation, only about 10 minutes ago, so stick with me. We now live in a digital world, there's no doubting that, but really digital changes everything. For the first time, we are able to have conversations with our audience around our stories on different channels. Digital opens up an enormous opportunity for us as storytellers. So what makes a good story digital? Well, number one is you have to be connected, meaning you have to connect your audience with each other. And you have to connect yourself to your audience. You have to make the story universal. Which means putting your video stories on social media channels, which is all about engagement and building awareness. And for the first time in history, storytellers can have a level of intimacy that we've never had before on social media. The digital environment has turned our audiences into connected communities and made visual communications more important than ever before. I iPad, iPhone, I do. The Royal Wedding. Now, the Royal Wedding was viewed by over half a billion people on their mobile devices streamed live on YouTube. Extraordinary. And YouTube is the behemoth of social media. YouTube is a massive social media marketing channel. YouTube numbers can be staggering. Look, 100 hours of video are uploaded every minute. That's more than doubled last year's volume. 
YouTube's demographic is broad, 18 to 54 year olds, meaning your demographic is in there. YouTube is localised in 56 countries across 61 languages and more than 1 billion unique visitors each month to YouTube. Now that's hard to get your head around, it's even hard for me, but that's kind of the whole point. YouTube is a big deal. Online video is a pretty big deal now. Video is so big, so important, there were 33 billion video views per month compared to 15 billion searches. Meaning video views have doubled searches. It'll be more than 90% of consumer traffic next year will be video. So uploading your video story to YouTube and social media sites not only gets your video story more eyeballs, it increases search engine rankings because the search engines love to index video. But that's for another presentation for another time. So your audience is waiting and watching, so use video on social media to get found, get viewed, and get your message and your story out there. For some of you asking, but why? What does it all mean? Well, it means this. The attention of your customers, your friends, your advocates, your stakeholders, your audience is shifting and it's shifting fast. The eyes and ears of the people you want to reach are in very different places now than what they were five years ago or even two years ago. And as storytellers, that's something that we need to reconcile. Most people treat social media as a distribution channel, which it is. But the trick here, the way to truly succeed and provide value on these channels is lean towards native storytelling. Video and social media together make a very powerful combination. Video and social media together are a match made in storytelling heaven. A little bit of advice. Now, sure, you can get your colleague in your office or even your uncle with a camcorder to shoot your video for you. And if you know a rock star, you can get him to do it for you. I actually know a couple, but that's for another presentation for another time. But we all know it's best to present yourself and your business in a professional manner. So video didn't really kill a radio star. Put simply, video is a powerful way to connect. Video and the internet has created one hell of a storytelling opportunity for everyone. Video is dramatic, inspiring, humbling and moving. Video is universal. Video just simply connects people. Now here's a video to finish off with. Now, like the ad says, video creates happiness. Video storytelling has changed my world. It's made it richer, deeper, more meaningful. And if any of you are wondering what happened to Layla, the orphaned Afghan baby I mentioned off the top of this presentation, well, Layla's now five years old and she's my daughter. My wife and I adopted her in 2008 when she was seven months old. And of course, I've got a 10 second video to show you. <laughs> Let's go. Come on. <laughs>
So we, we celebrated the first day of school in February this year. You see, the power of video can change lives. It changed mine. Thank you for listening and watching. I'm Greg Williams.